So Dan is going to tell us about the Andrew effect in slow motion. Dan, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Eduardo, thank you for the introduction. Uh, as Eduardo said, this is work I did at the University of Waterloo with Silas Bren and Eduardo. Uh, we have an archive number here. You can go check that out. Uh, and Eduardo, yeah, I already mentioned I'm at Oxford now. Uh, here's my email and my website. Uh, so let's just uh, jump into it. So I'll be telling you about the UNRWA effect in slow motion. So Rob already introduced uh, the UNRWA effect, and I think we all know quite a lot about it, so I, I don't feel the need to introduce it. Um, but why is direct detection hard? What I'm going to be talking about today is a, a sort of setup on which you could build an experimental proposal to measure the UNRWA effect. But there's some theoretical interest in this, too, in this setup as well. Okay, so issue number one, which is much discussed, is that reasonable under temperatures require huge acceleration. And so for instance, one Kelvin uh, requires 10 to the 19 Gs, which is the strength of gravity on Earth. So that's a very common, a much discussed problem. There's a second issue, which is not so well discussed, is that thermalization is a slow process, slow in quotes. Um, the, the thermalization time for any thermometer has to be much larger than the Heisenberg time of the thermometer. And these towers mean it's the proper time of the thermometer. So this has to be larger than two pi times the gap, or two pi divided by the gap, which is the Heisenberg time. Basically, the thermometer has to take one tour around its Hilbert space or phase space before it can have a chance to even thermalize. And so for, for just a generic atomic transition that I pick, 21 centimeters, this Heisenberg time is four nanoseconds which is fast on human time scales, but compared to this acceleration, it's very slow. So what, what do these two issues imply together? It's that if we take huge accelerations for these long times, then we get out astronomical distances. If I use the numbers above this acceleration and this time here, you put them together and you get A tau thermal over C is 4,000. Actually, it has to be much larger than 4,000 here. I've just used the Heisenberg time. But anyway, so you get 4,000. 4,000 isn't a large number, but let's look at how it enters the equations. So from the rest frame of the detector to its final frame, once it's done thermalizing, uh, you have to have a, a Lorentz factor between those two frames of e to the 4,000. And this propagates through into the distances and times in the lab frame. The distance is e to the 4,000 millimeters, and the time is e to the 4,000 picoseconds. So even though the, this time is small, for the probe, the proper time is small, but lab time is just absolutely huge if you want to do any direct detection along these lines. So really, we need to make this 4,000 number smaller. And what that means is we need to have A tau thermal over C much or less than or about one. All right, so, so fair enough. Let's take that, let's, let's now consider a different proposal that has A tau thermal over C less than or about one. You can, there's a simple line of inequalities here that shows you why that's an issue as well. So one is larger than about this number, which has to be much larger than the Heisenberg time with the acceleration. So you can rewrite this to be the ratio of the under temperature over the gap. And so you end up with this ratio much, much less than one. So if we go for these uh, small accelerations and small times, then you have to have very few excitations, is what this ends up saying. So it seems like we have a dilemma. Either A tau is much larger than one, and we have astronomical distances and times, or A tau is less than or about one, and we have very few excitations. This is all to sort of motivate our uh, proposal, because we claim to be able to get around this. So is picking one of these unavoidable? Uh, I'm going to claim that it's not, and we have a good way to do that. There are actually two ways around that sort of quick argument that I uh, presented. What we assumed in that is that the probe is always accelerating in the same direction. And that's why we accumulated all this speed and all this distance in the same direction, which ultimately was what caused the, one of the problems. So let's instead have the acceleration change direction. And immediately two ways to do that should come to mind. There's one where you have a circular trajectory, uh, which is discussed in this paper. And I think we have a few of the authors here in the audience, uh, uh, Cisco and Jorma and Silke are here, I think. So we have this circular trajectory where you move up in space time in a helix, or then there's this other one, an alternating linear, where you accelerate 
and then you suddenly switch to decelerating in the opposite direction and decelerate to a stop and then accelerate and decelerate as well. So these are two options to, to fix this in the same direction problem. The issue with both of these is that they introduce jerks into the detector. And by jerk, I mean third time derivatives. So you don't have a constant acceleration. Uh, so we have a constant jerk on the left-hand side and a sudden jerk on the right-hand side. We have sudden jerks at each of these inflection points. Okay, so uh, a good question that might follow from this, and I think this was asked uh, after the last talk, was will the probe still thermalize to a temperature proportional to the acceleration on these jerky trajectories, right? It's not obvious that it will. Uh, and if so, is the temperature independent of everything else, independent of the probe gap and the orbit speed and the orbit radius? And so this study here that I'm citing down here uh, looked at the circular trajectory case in particular in 2 plus 1 and 3 plus 1b and found out how the probe's final temperature depends on these other parameters that I'm mentioning here. And they, it, the study indicates that while you do get some proportionality to the acceleration, in general, it's not independent of everything else. Which I, I think that's a problem. And to, to answer Rob's question, uh, or the, to restate Rob's question, when can we trust our thermometers? Can we trust thermometers that depend on these other factors? I think there's a very clear reason why we can't. But when is a temperature a temperature? So you may ask, you may be skeptical of what I'm saying and say, but why should we demand P proportional to A and that it's independent of everything else? Isn't it enough to have temperature proportional to A with some proportionality constant? And with that proportionality constant, roughly constant, with say varying by 10 plus or minus 10% over some regime of interest? You might think that that's, that's good enough and that, that these can be goodish thermometers and they can tell us something about what's going on. But I, I, I want to push back on that and say that it's not enough. And here's, here's the reason. Uh, it's very basic thermodynamics which leads me to this conclusion, is that by the zeroth law of thermodynamics, temperature is a label for equivalence classes of equilibrium systems. And what that means is that if the unread temperature is supposed to be the temperature of something, then any thermometer has to agree on that temperature measurement. Imagine it didn't. Imagine you had something of some temperature and you put one thermometer in contact with it and it says one Kelvin. And you put another thermometer in contact with it. And both these thermometers thermalize with the thing, but the second one reads off 1.1 Kelvin. These are, these are bad thermometers, obviously. But the way to really make that concrete is to put those two thermometers, which are now both thermal with the system being measured, put them in contact with each other, and you would find heat flow between them. And so these temperatures can't be working as described, they, they you really any temperature which varies from thermometer to thermometer, from thermometer to thermometer is not a temperature. But it's not the temperature of something that you are thermalizing with. All right, so I, I think this is a problem with these circular uh, proposals, and so we have a sort of alternate proposal. What is the source of these sort of not a temperature issues in the circular trajectory setup? In my mind, it is what I just introduced. It's, it's the constant jerks that the probe undergoes. And now those were present in the linear setup as well. But in, what I'm claiming is that in the linear case, we can make some adjustments to completely remove these in the alternating linear setup. And in particular, on the left here, I've got a space-bound diagram for, for this modified alternating linear setup that I want to talk about. We have the red trajectory here is the probe accelerating and decelerating, accelerating and decelerating. And the new addition here are these blue things. These are cavity walls that we're introducing that go up here. And they intersect with the trajectory at each of these uh, acceleration switching points. So by taking Dirichlet boundary conditions at the cavity walls, we can completely remove the effects of the jerks. I do mean completely. There's no approximation to get rid of them. So each time that the probe has one of these jerks and changes its acceleration suddenly, it's completely decoupled from the field. It may want to absorb extra photons at that time or emit extra photons at that time, but it can't because it's completely decoupled from the field. So hopefully this will uh, uh, remove some of those jerk-based effects and we'll find a better, better temperature coming out of this thing at the end. But you might be skeptical. This seems like a pretty radical change to the setup, all these cavity walls, 
what consequences can we expect from this sort of alteration? I'll go through some positive ones first and then, and then the negative ones which you might anticipate. And the first good reason, the pro here, a reason to hope that this is okay, is that we've completely removed the jerks. And so we should get a better temperature response if it does thermalize. Second reason is that the cavity modes are discrete. And so it's easier to calculate with. That's a sort of pragmatic upside. The third reason this might be good is that it, we get at the end of the day discrete microbian dynamics. Without making a microbian assumption, we get out truly discrete microbian dynamics. And what I mean by that is cell by cell, we have the same update map. So a cell is, uh, I didn't mention a cell is two cavities side by side. So this is one cell, and then there's a second cell where we accelerate and decelerate. When you, when you cross one of the cells, you just apply some CPTP map to the state to get the next state. Right? And what, the, what causes this is the, the cavity wall shield the probe from the wider environment. So this is again, a very pragmatic, useful tool. And I'll talk about it more in a second. Uh, the fourth reason this is a good thing, you might think this is a good thing, is that it lets us get around that dilemma that we were talking about earlier. So let, let tau max be the proper time that the probe is in one of the cavities. In principle, we can have this less than the thermalization time, which means that we're not assuming that the probe thermalizes within a single cavity. Instead, what we're thinking is that it interacts with lots of cavities and by this long process comes to thermalize them with them all collectively. And in this case, we can have, we can avoid becoming ultra relativistic, which was the initial problem. If, if this gamma max, which is based on the tau max time is much less than gamma thermal, which was e to the 4,000 or something like that, remember, we can, we can avoid having this be very large. And if we can get a tau max to be around one, then we can avoid the astronomical distances and things. Okay, so those are some positive aspects of this setup and they're pragmatic and they help us avoid this dilemma. So fair enough, but again, this seems like a radical change to the setup. What, what negative consequences are there? There are, there are two. Which, seem, which come out to be relevant. The cavity modes here are discrete. We're not in a continuum. We're not in empty space, right? We've broken the Lorentz symmetry. So the probe might be able to resolve this discreteness of the cavity and spoil the effect. Okay, that's a valid concern. Um, and second, there's a second concern is that cavity walls also trap the probe in with radiation from within the current cavity. In the space-time diagram here, I've drawn these black lines, which is a null particle moving back and forward across the cavity. And you can see if the probe doesn't escape the first cavity quick enough, if it exits somewhere up here at the top half of the diagram, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, um, it would interact with this same proton many times going back and forward. And any other junk that it emits will also bounce back and forward. Right? So the probe would, in this sense, be seeing its own reflection in the cavity walls, which, which would not be a good thing. But to give a spoiler for the later bit of the talk, luckily there are regimes where both of these cons that I've mentioned are avoided and they're avoided simultaneously. Uh, but, but I'll come to that in a second. To, to give a concrete example of what we might think of when we put this into an experiment is we could either use voltages, which is what I've talked about here in this uh, diagram. So we have the probe traveling through and say it's a charged probe and it accelerates by this voltage and then decelerates and then it accelerates and decelerates. It's being pushed and pulled by the voltages. Or you could also probably do this with laser pulses. We're not really committed to a particular experimental implementation. But one thing which would hold in any implementation is that we can reuse old cavities once they return to their ground state. So once the probe goes through all of these, it'll mess up each field, but if they have some finite quality factor, they'll relax at some rate. And then we can circle back and come back through them again, a second lap around. So we don't need a, a huge number of cavities to do this. Okay, I'd like to tell you the results, but first uh, I sh we should state some details of the setup. We have a one plus one D massless scalar field phi and a harmonic oscillator probe Q with a gap omega. And they couple linearly with the point-like steering function in this way, this is all very standard. Coupling strength lambda here, uh, probe operator and the field operator evaluated at the location of the probe. And the dynamics here is given by repeated applications of some map phi cell. 
I mentioned earlier that this is a very nice thing that comes out of introducing the cavity walls. So we just repeatedly apply this map and it uh, chunk by chunk moves us through the evolution. And there are uh, some other aspects of this which make this a particularly easy type of dynamics to evaluate. So the, our setup is all Gaussian uh, and we have this repeated update map here and putting those together along with a lot of the work I did in my PhD thesis uh, we can use this Gaussian interpolated collision model formalism uh, to find out what the fixed point of this map is and what its convergence rate is and really we have full access to any dynamical question we'd like to ask in this setting. Okay so let's talk about the results now we have four three parameters in our setup the cavity length the probe acceleration, the probe frequency, and the coupling strength. We make those all dimensionless with the length a l over c, omega l over c, and lambda l over square root of h bar c. And we fix the coupling strength to be 0 0.01. So what we're doing here is non-perturbative. So what do we find in terms of thermalization? The dynamics uh, has an attractive fixed point. And this attractive fixed point is nearly indistinguishable from thermal for all parameters considered. And I, I can't tell you too many details about that now, but it's all in the paper. But as such, what this means, the fact that the probe does thermalize, we can talk about the probe's temperature T, which we can make dimensionless by multiplying by L. Um, the under effect would have T proportional to A. And so we're gonna look for T zero proportional to A zero. Uh, so dt0 by da0 equals constant. And now it's important to remember that this temperature is the temperature of the probe. It's what Rob would have called the EDR temperature, although we're not exactly using EDR stuff to do this. Um, but this doesn't mean that the there is something in the environment which also has this temperature. Like I mentioned earlier, to establish there's something in the environment that has this temperature, you need to put it in contact with multiple thermometers and make sure they all have the same reading, exactly the same reading. Okay, so here's the results. Uh, I said we were interested in dt dA, uh, and we find that there is a regime over here where it's constant. On the x-axis, we have the log of the acceleration, and on the y-axis, we have the probe gap made dimensionless. So there is some region here where we find something like the under effect. And now something I should point out in connection to Roth's talk is that there are regions over here where dt dA is negative. So we get down into this blue region over here. So in this region, we have something like uh, an anti under effect, which is interesting. Okay, uh, so why did we lose this effect? We have it in this region. We have a dashed vertical line here. Left of this, the reason we lose the effect is that the probe sees its own reflection in a sense. Remember I showed the null trajectory bouncing back and forward. Uh, it sees some of those reflections and the under effect is spoiled over there. And above the dashed line, the probe has long enough to realize, hey, I'm in a cavity. I shouldn't be acting like I'm in free space. And the under effect is spoiled up there as well. But in this bottom region over here, there both effects are avoided and the under effect is not spoiled. So we have in this region T proportional to A, and also it's independent of omega and L and lambda, which as I stressed earlier is very important. So what is the slope in there, that value of dTDA? Uh, here are some horizontal slices from the previous figure. So these are horizontal cuts here at pi over 16 and pi over eight and pi over four. And so the right portion of the next plot corresponds to over here. Um, we see that it is constant over here and independent of the gap. And the value for dTDA over there is one half such that we have a temperature equals to one half h bar a over kdc. So we're just missing a factor of pi, otherwise we would have exactly the under effect in this region. Why are we missing the factor of pi? You can ask me later and I have some things to say about that. So in conclusion, I've cast the difficulty of detecting the uh, under effect as a dilemma. We need astronomical distances or time scales, or we need very low excitation numbers. This can be avoided by changing the direction of the acceleration in an alternating or linear way. 
but either way this introduces jerks which can muddy or distort the temperature acceleration relationship especially for the circular setups as i've argued but what we've shown is a cavity based alternating linear setup where the effects of these jerks can be completely removed and moreover the in this regime the cavity induced effects are also absent although they, they do appear where you sort of expect them to and as a final note uh, if you plug numbers into this formalism that we've been talking about uh, the proposal does seem to be experimentally feasible as well and i've got more slides on that if anybody wants to know so uh thank you for your attention if we have any questions thank you dan um all right other than that as usual please uh raise your hands if you have questions first questions from rob yeah thanks dan it's quite interesting so can you show the slides on feasibility yeah absolutely um okay so we we see that we can get this to work down to this vertical dashed line here in terms of decreasing the acceleration so where does that happen we lose the effect at accelerations of a0 the dimensionless acceleration equals one quarter that's where we lose it and so for a tabletop size setup which is like one meter it implies 10 to the 15 g's and for a LIGO size setup we can get down to as low as uh, 10 to the 11 g's and in either case the maximum Lorentz factor is only five fourths so we have it's not e to the four thousand no, it's much smaller than that so that's good um, and so what that means in terms of times is that the accelerations the probe needs to undergo need to be sustained across the cavity and the cavity crossing times in the lab time is like 10 nanoseconds or 40 microseconds in the two length scales we're talking about. So these times aren't tremendously long. Um, so we've avoided the astronomical distances and time scales, at least for one cavity. But what if we have to go through a huge number of cavities to get this to work? That obviously wouldn't be good. So we've crunched the numbers and it turns out that you need something like 70,000 cells for this coupling strength that we talked about here. And, and this N cells number scales with the coupling strength such that if you have a stronger interaction, it thermalizes quicker. Okay, but I said that we can reuse cavities once they relax back to the ground state. So we don't need 7,000 cavities all in a row. We need maybe a thousand of them and we'll lap around 70 times. Something like that would work. And so how long would it take to cross 70,000 cavities you take these, these cavity crossing times I mentioned here and just multiply them by 70,000 and you get that in the lab size, in the table size setup, it's 14 milliseconds to thermalize one probe. And in the LIGO size setup, it's about one minute to thermalize one probe. And so these, therm these are the times to thermalize one probe, but then how many probes do we need to thermalize for confidence detection? If we have to do a million of these probes, it's gonna take a million minutes, which is quite a long time. So last, last slide on this, uh, for these two scales that I've been talking about, the final probe temperatures are 300 microkelvin and 71 nanokelvin each. But the more relevant parameter is the expected number of excitations in the probe, which remember earlier in our dilemma, I said that this had to be much less than one. And if you pick numbers here, uh, you get that this can be about a half. So we can have about one half of an excitation in each probe that comes out of the system. And so if you're, if you're testing, is it excited at all versus not excited ground state, you only need to see a few of these before you can be pretty well assured that there is something going on where the probe's not in its ground state when it leaves this whole system. Uh, and here are some frequencies that we would need to achieve there. We'd need 60 megahertz for one probe in the one meter setup and 15 kilohertz in the LIGO sized setup. But what it seems like we've done here is we've avoided both of the horns of the dilemma. Uh, we can have non-astronomical distances and we can have a reasonable number of excitations in the probe once it's thermalized. Okay, 10 to the 11 is still pretty, that's a lot of Gs. Yeah, right. But it, this is 10 to the 11 is much smaller than anything else realistic. Yeah, yeah, it is. But I mean, one could consider, I mean, what if you put something inside the cavities to make the effective speed of light go down. Oh, interesting. Um, 
yeah, that, that's an interesting thought. I hadn't considered it. Anyway, that's I'll, I'll, others have questions, so. All right, the next question is Cisco. Um, hello, yeah, that was an interesting talk. Thank you for that. Um, I, have, I have two very quick questions. Um, one is about what exactly you meant. Actually, that slide is on the, I'll ask that question first. Is it exactly flat in that lower right corner region? Because I, I, I notice like it looks like there's some functional dependence um, and the, as you get out of that uh, ideal region, you have some blues and some changing colors. Is it right. identically flat in the bottom corner or is, are the other contributions just negligible? Um, they are very small. Um, here, here's, um, here's the slices of this plot. So this figure cut it horizontally and you can see DTA, sorry, DT0, DA here, the dashed line is at one half. Um, and so it's very close to one half for all of that and it converges I don't know if we looked at how quickly it converges, but this is this is the log here. So over over several orders of magnitude, it's very very constant. And um, okay. independence of with the gap here, all these curves are on top of each other as far as soon as here, right? So uh, I, I and do they the I, and this was all done. Do they there. converge identically though? Sorry. Do they converge identically uh, given the different parameter like gap and other parameters um, they may have. They seem to, yeah. This is all done numerically, uh, so I can't tell you for certain what's going on, but it seems uh, like I was I was just worried, it, I, I was wondering if the, the tiny wiggles as they converge all overlap with one another. Oh, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I wouldn't expect them to align exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, so then my question is kind of this, does seem to have some dependence on the parameters. It's just that the dependence is very small. So you have an effective thermometer that's very accurate in that regime, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with that. But okay. I, I, was, I was just wondering if your, your previous definition of thermometer was more strict than really makes sense because I don't know a thermometer in the world that is exactly that exactly has that feature and I'm not sure any thermometer in the world does satisfy that condition right um, um, anyway this is just oh so yeah yeah that's true I, I think questions about what exactly we mean by thermometry are very interesting um, because in, in practice of course thermometers only work over certain ranges right and we have so in order to get down to low temperatures we have a overlapping set of temperature standards in practice, which sort of relate to, it's like the astronomical distance ladder. Like it's the same thing for low temperatures. We have these cross validating things. So actual thermometry is very messy. But when we talk about thermodynamics, well, well I, should, I should distinguish, there's two types of thermometers. There's thermometers which measure temperatures by thermalizing with the thing they're trying to measure. And then somehow about themselves, the temperature is manifestly obvious. And there's other things which have some more complicated functional dependence on the temperature of the thing they're interacting with. And we learn what that function is, measure the output, and then there's some process of evaluation or function inversion to find that, right? So I'm talking about thermometers that actually thermalize with the thing they're trying to measure. And in that case, if you have two thermalizing thermometers which thermalize two different temperatures on the same system, well then like you violate all the laws of thermodynamics. <laughs> after that. Okay. So, okay. So Thank you. Yeah, maybe, it, it is. It's complicated. <laughs> maybe, maybe one comment on that, right? The, the, the convergence of this is, uh, is really, so, so the, the, what happens on the right of this plot, right, is that, uh, uh, that's what Cisco, is that the probe starts not seeing, not having enough time to resolve the cavity and not seeing many reflections of itself, right? So of course, it's not going to be exact. But one can see how universally any thermometer converges to the same asymptote. So maybe you can think of it in an asymptotic sense, right? So that's that's kind of the for any for any particular value you pick, it's not going to be exact. But asymptotically, as the acceleration goes high, right, so it, it does converge to the value that is independent on the parameters of the thermometer. I would I would formulate that. Right. I, yeah, I, de I, brother, I definitely agree about that. But that's not the regime I'm interested in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah fair I'm enough, interested but in acceleration down here at a quarter. 
Yeah. Uh, we just when we start to lose it. I mean, I, I definitely agree it will all converge for very large accelerations, but I want an experiment. So I, I think that 0 0.5 is still within experimental uh, uh, reach. Uh, the, that's something we can discuss. The, the circular uh, case converges in the limit of large radius exactly to just the linearly accelerating case with a small velocity offset. So, I mean, yeah. So, so I, I would argue perhaps that the convergence of this is faster, but that's something to discuss. <laughs> uh, there's a question, I think, is not, there's not a hand, but I think there's a question by, uh, by Rick. I'm not sure if he's still there. The yeah. Uh, actually, the, the first question that I had was related to Cisco's essentially, and the definition of the thermometer. But I do have another one regarding the, the factor of pi. So previously, you, you didn't have a, an explanation for this. So apparently, you, you've found a way of, of justifying the, the missing pi. So I'd love to hear more about that. Well, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as to say I have an explanation for the missing pi. Um, but we have some ideas about why it's OK that it's not there. Um, and the, the principal one in my mind is that if, when we go to the experimental setup, let me get it here. Um, okay, here's this one. The probe um, does not thermalize inside of a single cavity. Its thermalization is necessarily tied to the existence of many, many cavities, right? So if we take the L goes to infinity, the length of each cavity to get very large, uh, then you sort of spoil the effect because then in the limit it's only in one cavity and we need to cross many of them. So what, what that shows is that this scenario we're talking about is not connected by a limit to the uh, canonical under effect. There's no way to take this and take a limit of it to get another one. So, uh, so it's not uh, a problem that we have these two different values for this thing because there's no, there's no path connecting them where we would have to have L dependent to have a jump or something. Um, so also this is in one plus one D, uh, and we might find that some dimensional factors are missing if we did this in three plus one D. Eduardo, I know you have thoughts on this as well. Do you want to say anything? Well, I mean, there's a, there's a two, two reasons here. So the, the one thing that you can check is that this setup does not go exactly as, as I was saying to an infinitely long uh, cavity, because this setup in the limit is a setup of cells of one cavity superimposed with another one and another, right? So in that sense, it would not go to the Andrew temperature to the, to the Andrew scenario when you take the L of the cavity to go to infinity. And this because this is in a cavity, it may capture geometric factors more sensitively, is basically what you said. So the, the geometric factors uh, 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 of the shape of the cavity, right, are order one factors. And it's, uh, it's thinkable that powers of pi appear in higher dimensions indeed. So it might be related to geometric factors. But again, of course, we don't have proof of that. So. But, but there's no like hand wavy argument saying, oh, we, sh we should lose a pie because of the, no. I don't know. <laughs> okay. If that's what you wanted, no, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd love to have something like this. That would be amazing. Me too. <laughs> but yeah, thanks for the, the talk, man. All right, any more questions? If not, please, let's thank Dan again.